speaker will be Tom Horn, who is the owner of Tom Horn Appraisals. Tom's appraisal career began in 1990 when he was looking for a change from working in the consumer finance field. During his time as a loan officer, he was exposed to the appraisal profession. At the current time, he holds the SRA designation from the Appraisal Institute. He concentrates in the area of single family, vacant land, two to four family, and co condominium appraisals in central Alabama area, Jefferson, Shelby, and surrounding counties. In addition to performing appraisals for first mortgage loans and refinancing, <clears throat> he prepares reports for other uses such as estate planning, private mortgage insurance removal, for sale by owner, marketing, and insurance valuations. Many clients include banks and mortgage companies for home purchases and refinances, <clears throat> as well as leading real estate agents in the Birmingham real estate market who trust him to provide them with a reliable appraisal to aid them in the accuracy pricing their listings. On a personal side, he's been married to his wife, Gina, for 28 years, and they have two awesome children, Bryant and Camille. <laughs> In addition to keeping busy with his appraisal work, he enjoys spending time with family and friends, as well as keeping up with college football. Tom, take it away with the, your information that you're going to provide. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, let me see about getting my screen up here. All right. Okay. Does that look good? Can you all see that? Yep. Okay. All right. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And as an appraiser, I like to share with others in the real estate field the process that, uh, that we go through, appraisers go through in choosing comparables. I believe that if agents in particular know what the appraisers are looking for and do the same when they're pricing homes for sale, then the comps that they choose will be the same or similar and the price involved or arrived at, excuse me, will be similar. Uh, and hopefully that will decrease the likelihood that there will be significant gaps between contract price and appraisal values. Um, so today, again, I'm gonna be talking about how appraisers choose comps. And hopefully, uh, you know, that information can help, uh, you know, many others in the real estate fields, but especially agents. Um, first of all, um, uh, let's see here. Well, let's see. The slideshow is not quite working, but it's just a second. Pardon the delay here. Okay. All right. So first of all, we need to um, look to uh, and ask ourselves, what is a comp? A comp um, is a comp uh, is a sale, but a sale is not always a comp. So uh, we have to define what a comp is. A comp is going to be located in a similar competitive market area as the uh, the property that we're looking at. It, they're going to be similar in physical characteristics. Uh, they're uh, hopefully they will have occurred recently and they will compete with the subject property, meaning that a, a potential buyer would look at this one as well as the one that we're trying to price. Um, one of the things I've ran into though, um, is the fact that sometimes uh, information that I see in the MLS is that we don't have correct square footage and we have to start with correct square footage in order to price a property correctly. Because if you don't have it, of course, the uh, you know most pricing is based on the square footage of a home. If you don't have that right, the, the estimate's gonna be wrong. Um, it, it's important to know that all square footage of a home is not the same. Uh, and the, the, the main criteria that we look for or that we use to, um, to uh, sift through sales is square footage. Um, and, the, and, and the square footage that we, we use for that is the, what we call gross living area, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, you know, if we look at um, what happens if the square footage is wrong, um, we, we, we don't price the properties uh, correctly. I mean, if you if you think a home um, is larger than what it actually is, you're probably going to be using sales of larger homes, and, and in which case you're going to overprice the home. And if a home is, if you think it's smaller than what it actually is, you're probably going to be use, using, um, you know, comparables that are smaller 
than uh, what they should be, and the and the the price is going to be lower than what it should be. So, and a square footage is really important. Uh, again, like what I said, um, all square footage is not the same. Uh, gross living area typically contributes the most to the value of a home, and it consists of the heated and cooled above grade living area. And when I say above grade living area, I'm talking about that area above the ground. Um, it, it does not include the the basement area. Um, porches, patios, and decks, they contribute to value as well, but they're not included in that gross living area square footage. And that's the same with um, um, basement square footage too. Um, basement square footage is, is given consideration in the whole scheme of the appraisal or, or pricing of a property, but uh, and it does contribute to value, but it's not lumped in with the gross living area, which is, like I said, the number that we use to kind of help sift through sales and qualify sales when we're looking at square footage. Um, I always recommend um, to, to get um, accurate square footage. I give three um, options. Uh, the best option to get accurate square footage when pricing a property is through an old appraisal. Um, if a property has not changed physically uh, in square footage, then the old appraisal is going to be uh, the most uh, accurate. Um, and the, the appraisers use a, a measurement standard. It's called ANSI, and it gives us um, guidelines to follow when, when measuring a home and, and calculating gross living area. So if you look at an old appraisal, it's uh, that appraiser will have used ANSI or uh, a similar type of standard. So that square footage is going to be very similar to the square footage that uh, the a mortgage appraiser will use to come up with the square footage when the comb goes under contract. So again, the old appraisal is the, usually the most accurate. Um, there's also uh, tax records. Uh, a lot of tax records are not accurate. However, there are situations where tax information can be accurate. In the Birmingham area, uh, tax records are most accurate with like one level homes without basements, you know, without a second floor, that type of thing, uh, a garden garden home uh, style situation. So um, it's fairly accurate there. Um, it may be different in different areas. Uh, so it's important to know uh, which um, type of home that the tax records have a uh, good square footage for. Um, if uh, if you don't have an old appraisal and you don't trust the tax records, I always recommend getting the home measured. Um, uh, appraisers offer this type of service and they will go out and they will measure the home similar to what they would measure for, for the appraisal, except they just do the sketch. So those are three sources of good square footage to start with to help in pricing a home correctly. Uh, like I said, it's the, an old, either an old appraisal, tax records, or getting the home measured. So uh, in choosing comparables, um, there's certain criteria that we go by. We, we look at what we call bracketing, um, the physical characteristics of the property, and I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, comparables should not be chosen by only looking at price. Um, they should be arm's length transactions. Uh, the comps should be similar in location, construction quality, and hopefully they will have occurred recently, especially in today's market when we have such an increasing market and the market's changing so rapidly. Um, in addition to closed sales, we can also look at pending sales. Um, we also look at, at homes that are similar in size and also similar in features. That's gonna help us give the most accurate pricing on a property. So I mentioned the, the term bracketing. A lot of people don't know what this means, but what it is, is you, um, uh, at a minimum, appraisers use three sales. Now, uh, agents can use uh, a similar type of situation where they use, you know, look at the uh, at least three sales. But I always recommend looking at a property uh, that's a little bit bigger than the property I'm trying to price, and then also a little bit smaller, and then trying to get one that's, um, that's about the same size. And the idea behind this is that um, when appraisers make adjustments on their appraisals, um, they have to adjust for differences. So if you have a larger home, a larger home that's in square footage, you have to um, make a downward adjustment for that larger square footage. So if you make the downward adjustment on the square footage on a larger home, and then make an upward adjustment on the, um, on the smaller home, and then of course the, the one that's very similar in size, you probably won't make many adjustments at all. Well, the, um, the, the range between the high and the low is going to be a lot lower, and that, that indicated range is going to help you price the, the property more accurately because the gap is not going to be larger. And it's better than 
uh, using homes that are larger, you know, using all larger homes or all smaller homes, because that's not going to give you as good of an indication um, of value. So using the bracketing method is usually uh, helps provide the most um, reliable indication of value. Um, comparables should never be, uh, be chosen based only on the price. Because if you have an idea of the price in mind, maybe, you know, just off the, off the top of your head, you think it should sell for a certain amount, or maybe a, a seller, you know, has an idea of what they think it should sell for, you're probably going to find sales that support that. And that's not always the best thing because um, just uh, bracketing on price alone is not going to give you the most accurate indication of value because within that price, there's other things built into that, such as more square footage, more features like pools or more acreage and that type of thing. So you really need to uh, look at other factors rather than just price um, or, uh, excuse me, or price per square foot. Um, price per square foot, I know a lot of agents use that as the holy grail of pricing a home, but if you only look at price per square foot and no other factors, then that can also give you uh, an inaccurate indication of value. The only time that I would suggest using um, price per square foot is in a neighborhood where all the homes are very similar, such as the garden homes down the neighborhood that I talked about. If you, uh, if all the homes are very similar with a very tight square footage range, then the price per square foot is probably going to be pretty tight too. So in that situation, it might work. But if you are in another neighborhood where homes uh, there's a wide range of square footage and types of homes. Maybe you have some homes with basements and finished basements and that type of thing. The range in price per square foot is going to be so wide that it's not going to give you, by itself, it's not going to give you a good indication of value. And so that's something to consider as well. Um, good comps are arm's length transactions. But, and by arm's length transactions, I mean that they are not divorce sales, they're not foreclosures and they're not short sales. Um, the only time that these types of sales should be used is if they are reflective of the market. Um, right now, there's not a whole bunch of foreclosures going on. So you might have one out of 10 sales as a foreclosure. And in that case, they shouldn't even be considered. Whereas, you know, back in 2008, 2009, after the real estate crash, you may have had nine out of 10 uh, homes that sold that were foreclosures and they should be considered. So you really have to look at what's happening in the market um, to determine if, if a, a home, you know, like a foreclosure like that should be sold. But again, in this market that we're in right now, I don't see that as an issue. Uh, another thing that we look at is that the, uh, the comp should be similar in location. Uh, there's an old uh, a rule that a lot of people believe in that uh, comps have to be within a mile of the property you're pricing or, or appraising, and that's just not the case as far as Fannie Mae is concerned. Uh, Fannie Mae actually says you can go as far as you want to to find comparable sales as long as you uh, make adjustments for any differences that may exist in the location and as long as you explain it. I think a lot of, um, of the understanding of the one-mile rule uh, may have come about because it's a lender guideline as opposed to a Fannie Mae guideline. So um, uh, with that being said, um, I think the best comps are those that are in the subject's neighborhood or subdivision. So if you can find those, those are the best ones to use. Now, if you can't find those, it's okay to go outside of the immediate subdivision or the neighborhood and look in another neighborhood that may have similar type homes and be uh, within what we call a competitive market area, uh, which is an area that competes with the property that we're, you know, that we're pricing. And school systems have a lot to do with that as well. School systems in the, in the Birmingham market drive property values, and I'm sure that's uh, similar to other areas as well. So that should be factored in too. I mean, I would rather go a little bit further away to get a property, a comp that's in a similar school system as opposed to one that may be one block away, but it's in a superior school system. So that's something to consider as well. Um, comps should be a similar construction quality. Um, homes that are in a similar uh, quality of construction usually are priced very similar to each other and the value is relatively equal. Um, so what you might wanna ask yourself is if a buyer would consider purchasing the home that you're looking at, but that maybe have a, a 
uh, better construction quality. You know, better construction quality puts homes in different price ranges. So that may put somebody out of the their, their price range. So again, uh, the construction quality <laughs> is very important. Um, comps should have occurred recently. And oh boy, that is so important in today's appreciating market. Um, on, on a general rule of thumb, I like to try to keep sales within 90 days. Uh, however, um, in today's market with things increasing so much, I try to stay with you know, 30 days or less if possible. That's not always possible. That's what I shoot for. In a more stable market uh, like we had you know, a year or two ago before the pandemic and before interest rates dropped so low and, and demand was increased, um, you know, older sales might be relevant if the market was stable. Um, right now, that's really not the case, but you, you can use uh, older sales to look at as, as context in what's happening with the market right now because you can look at, at homes that sold six months ago and also look at home, similar homes that have sold you know, within the past week or so and see how much the market has increased. So that can kind of give you a little bit of context to go on. Um, in addition to close sales, uh, you know, uh, appraising is generally a historical look at property values. To get around that, appraisers are able to use pending sales. And I also recommend that agents or anybody else looking to price a home look at pending sales as well. Now, when I say pending sales, uh, it has to be the right type of pending sale. Uh, the, they have to really have passed the, all the tests, which mean that the, um, you know all the financing is taken care of, um, the appraisal is done, and they're just waiting to close. So that is a very good pending sale to look at, as opposed to maybe a, a home that went under contract, you know, yesterday or last week that may not have had all the, uh, you know, may not have had an appraisal, it may not appraise, that type of thing. But as far as, um, you know, good comparables, uh, a good pending uh, sale that, that's had the finance and the appraisal is probably about the best you can get next to the closed sale that occurred real recently, uh, because it's going to give you a, a great picture of what's going on right now compared to, you know, historically within the past 30 to 60 days or whatever. Um, comps um, should always be similar in size or, you know, within the, the range that I tell you with the bracketing and so forth. And I always recommend that to start with uh, that homes that are maybe 10 to 15 percent larger or smaller uh, to bracket the, uh, the square footage of the home. Um, then uh, when, you, when, you, when you're only working with 10 or 15 percentage uh, of the larger size and so forth, um, that's going to increase the probability that you're going to come up with a better price because the more adjustments you make on a comparable, the less reliable it's going to be. Um, if, if it's not possible to look at uh, sales that are within that 10 to 15 percent range, you can go a little bit higher and I would recommend maybe going to 20 to 25 percent, but I wouldn't go any higher than that because again, once you get into properties where you have to make uh, or account for differences in value due to square footage or features or things like that, they become less and less reliable. So it's important um, to work with something that's pretty similar in size. Um, you know, again, comparables should have similar features. Uh, for example, if you're working uh, on pricing a home that has a pool, then you should use uh, comparables that have pools or barns or acres or that type of thing. Or on the, on the, uh, on the flip side, if, if you're pricing a home that does not have a pool, I wouldn't use a home with a pool. Um, I would maybe look at alternatives, maybe in another neighborhood uh, to a home that um, is similar um, in square footage and all other features uh, to get around using that one with a pool or the other larger feature like a barn or acreage and that type of thing. And again, I would stick with uh, a similar school system. So because that is so important, I uh, include that in the similar features as well. So after you've, you know, you've collected all the sales that you believe to be comparable to your property, what you have to do is you have to look to see what, what's the high and the lows in that range, because typically your home's going to fall within that range. Um, you also look at what the number of listings tell you. you know, um, if you look at the number of listings that we have now that was covered previously um, in, the, in the previous presentation, um, the inventory is down so low that there's an undersupply of homes, which is driving prices up. And, and, and because there's such high demand, um, it's, um, 
you can afford, you know, if, if, the, if the supply is down, you can afford to be a little bit more aggressive in your pricing of the property because you know the demand is there and the people will probably, you know, pay for that uh, because of the low inventory. You also have to look at how your property fits into the range of the comps in terms of size, quality, and features. So if the, if the home you're trying to um, price is of a smaller square footage or the quality just isn't as uh, up there with the rest of the homes uh, of the comparables that you look at or the features, if it just doesn't have as many features, then you know reconciling at the lower end of that range is probably smarter because the, uh, that's uh, how they're gonna compete with the other properties that are available. Now, if your home is, uh, is a larger home or better quality and has better features, then it's uh, reconciling at that upper end it would probably be wise there. Um, then, you know, of course, like I said, you just see how your property fits in using those criteria, and that's going to help you uh, find out maybe where that property should be priced at based on the, the, uh, the you know, the closed sales, pendings, and the active listings. The active listings are very important because that's what uh, the competition, current competition for the property is going to be. Some of the common issues that I have found uh, in speaking with agents is that they use a uh, kind of too restrictive uh, distance guidelines, uh, you know, trying to stay within that one mile guideline. Um, they and they also try to stay within the immediate subdivision or the neighborhood, which is good if there are sales there. But if there are not, then it's okay to move outside of that into a competitive market area, uh, like I mentioned before. Um, I also mentioned uh, using older sales, but that would only be wise in a stable market, which we're really not in right now. We're really in an appreciating market, so the older sales probably wouldn't give you as accurate of an indication value. Again, uh, you know, looking at current listings and pending sales is gonna help you zero in on that. Um, then and using the bracketing guidelines within reason will help you uh, come up with a value that's going to be reflective of the market as well. I always recommend also to look at expired or withdrawn listings, which we don't have a lot of these days because most of the, in, because the inventory is so low, most homes sell. But in, in more uh, stable markets, uh, when that's not the case, it's, a, it's good to look at expired and withdrawn listings too, because typically those were um, taken off the market because they were priced too high. So if you, if you look at what they were priced at, then that can kind of give you an idea of what the upper limit of pricing might be for your home. Um, that really um, does it as far as how appraisers you know, choose comparables. I just wanted to also give a couple of uh, thoughts from, uh, from my perspective as an appraiser on how buyers can, can possibly win a bid in a hot real estate market. Um, again, from the appraiser's perspective, it's a very important, you know, with uh, the um, information that's available online and um, that type of thing that, that buyers be knowledgeable about what the upper and lower limits of the price ranges are. For example, if, if, if you knew the, the uh, upper limit of the, uh, of the price of the home that you wanted to buy was like maybe 150, it would uh, help you to make a decision not to make, not, not to make a, uh, an offer in the 175 or $200,000 range. And that is happening. There are so many stories of, uh, from agents I hear about uh, homes being bid up so far above list price and uh, uh, it, multiple times, you know, 20 or 30 um, um, buyers doing that too. But um, it's important to know those limits because if you if you bid too high, then a seller may not want to take the chance that it might not appraise. So you really have to be aware of that. But then they also have to be aware that if it is above the list price, they need to know about making up the difference. And uh, they might also write in the contract uh, to, and have appraisal gap coverage to let the seller know that they will make up the difference if it does uh, not appraise, if it if appraises lower than the actual contract amount. It's very important also for uh, just seller, or excuse me, buyers to uh, know and have information, accurate information, as opposed to going on hearsay about what maybe things, what homes have sold for, uh, as opposed to what people say they do. I, I would always verify that type of information. The last two things I wanted to uh, point out was, uh, of course, agents, know about all this, but uh, it's always important for the buyer to have their, uh, their financing lined up because that's going to give them a heads up above the other uh, people that are bidding on the property because everybody else is going to have their, their financing lined up as well. Uh, and then the last thing is, um, is an agent CMA. You know, a listing agent typically does a CMA to price the home, but a buyer's agent can also do a CMA and uh, which might cover 
uh, sales or pending sales that have occurred since the home went on the market. And that can help um, help the buyer uh, zero in on a winning offer. So uh, that's basically all I have. Uh, we're going to have questions later on, so I'll skip that. But I just want to point out also that I do write uh, an appraisal blog to help answer questions that that um, agents and mortgage people and buyers and sellers might have. It's BirminghamAppraisalBlog.com. Um, what I've strived to do with that is just answer questions that I get, uh, you know, that people ask me because I figure if they have a question that others uh, will probably be asking the same thing. So if, uh, if you have an appraisal question, you can check out my blog. If, um, if it's not answered there, please let me know because I'd be more than glad to cover that. Um, so I'm always looking for um, information to cover and, and questions to answer to help other people out. Um, but if you have any kind of questions related to the appraisal field, and I can help you. It doesn't even have to uh, do with an appraisal that I've done. I have agents call me and ask me, why did the appraiser do this in this appraisal or something like that? And I'll try my best to answer those types of questions. Um, I'm always trying to um, help answer the question about why appraisers do what they do and how they do what they do. So I'll try to provide as good of an explanation as I can. So you can reach me at my phone or my email address. And again, I thank you for the time um, that I've been offered today.